Welcome back to another episode of Ask Boston Sax, the show where we take your questions about saxophones and really anything else and actually answer them. Later on, we'll have Kathy here from the Franklin Park Zoo with some of her four-legged friends. <laughs> hey, Jack, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the saxophone neck, how that changes the resistance and tone of a horn? I don't even need to answer this question. Just go to bostonsaxshop.com, buy a Boston Sack Shop heritage neck. You're gonna be fine. It'll answer all the questions for you. Just stop the video right now. No, seriously, the neck is really important. I mean, after you, the reed, and the mouthpiece, that is the first part of the signal chain going into the saxophone. And so overall, the neck will really change the overall resistance, intonation, and overall flexibility and ceiling of volume that a saxophone can have. Now, if you don't believe me, it's actually really fun that most modern summers, Yamahas and Yanagasawas, the most popular new saxophone manufacturers on the planet all use essentially the same receiver size. So what that means is the next time, if you own one of those horns, you're around somebody else who owns one of those horns, you can switch out the necks and immediately feel the difference. It's crazy, you put a Yamaha neck on a Selmer, it sounds like a Yamaha. The factors of a neck in a broad sense that can change how your horn plays is most importantly the bore. If you have a larger bore neck that's gonna offer more flexibility, also offer more ceiling of volume since you can move more air through it. The angle of the neck, a more upward angled neck is going to have less resistance because it's like you're taking a garden hose that's kinked and opening it up. The bore of the octave pip and the placement of the octave pip will change the overall intonation tendencies. There's a lot of different things that can make a really big difference and it's a nice way to be able to change up your horn without having to buy a new saxophone or get used to a new mouthpiece. Hey Jack, I've noticed that some manufacturers offer an unfiled and a filed saxophone reed. What's the difference? Okay, so the short version is filed versus unfiled in my very honest opinion, trying to be subtle about this, is it's absolutely unequivocally bull So a filed reed has a second cut that happens behind the actual cut of the vamp of the reed itself. And the claims that a lot of these companies make is by removing that material, it frees up the reed to vibrate more, it might be brighter, it might be more responsive, but if we look at how a reed actually functions on a mouthpiece, I can tell you that it should technically make absolutely no difference. And probably the differences that you might feel between two reeds that are the same cut, one filed and unfiled, it's probably just the inconsistency in the reeds themselves. So if we look how a reed operates when it comes to its interaction with the mouthpiece, we have to talk about the facing curve. The facing curve is essentially what the reed is bending and sealing against. And where that starts to happen on the mouthpiece is in front of the bottom part of the window. Now, anything below where the mouthpiece starts to curve away from that flat plane, that's where all the action is happening. And that's what controls the response of the mouthpiece, how the reed is gonna seal, all of the good stuff. Anything behind that is essentially completely flat and is being clamped down by the ligature, which means that it's not vibrating at all. And guess where that second cut on a filed reed is? right below the takeoff point of the facing curve, meaning that it's not part of where the reed is vibrating, hence why I don't believe it makes any difference in the sound whatsoever. Hey Boston Sack Shop, I have a question. A lot of mouthpiece makers claim that having thinner tip rails and side rails will change the response of a mouthpiece. What do you think? So the purposes of the tip rail and the side rail on a mouthpiece are essentially to give the reed a place to seal when you're articulating it. And as much as I would love to say that having thinner rails, since the Boston Sackshot mouthpieces definitely have them, will make a big difference in how it responds, I've got to admit that it really doesn't matter whatsoever. I think it really comes down to a point of pride of craftsmanship, and having thinner rails is much more difficult to do, especially if it's a mouthpiece that's being made by hand, and just shows the skill of the person who's at the bench, as opposed to actually making a really big difference in the tone. And it really sucks to have to admit that. <laughs> Hey Jack, I hope this question doesn't bore you, but how does the bore of the saxophone affect its sound? Okay, so first off, I'm the host of this show, which means that I get to make the joke, so if you're out there and you wanna submit a question like that, you can just go ahead and see yourself out. All right, fine. So the bore of the saxophone essentially affects the internal volume of the instrument itself. You gotta remember the saxophone is basically a giant cone, and if you don't learn anything from me, just remember that saxophone is a cone. Now, if the internal dimensions are bigger, that's going to mean that you have to move more air through the instrument in order to get it to project. 
Now, what this does do is give you more flexibility tonally. It gives you a higher ceiling of volume, but again, you're going to have to put more effort into playing the horn. Notable instruments that have a larger bore in comparison to most modern saxophones would be things like the Kahn's and Bishers from the mid-century. Having a smaller bore is more efficient. It means that you can use less air to be able to project. From a very general standpoint, having a smaller bore saxophone is also going to center the sound, maybe come off as a little bit brighter, but you're gonna have a little bit less of a ceiling of volume and overall tonal flexibility, because again, once you start putting a ton of air into a horn that has a smaller bore, like a modern Selmer, it will start to push back on you. Now, you of course can change all these factors by also modifying the neck, your mouthpiece, and your reeds, but if we're just talking about the bore of the horn, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better idea of how it will affect things. Hey Boston Sax, I'm trying to find a new mouthpiece, but I'm overwhelmed with all the choices out there. What's a good way to narrow it down? So one of the things that we like to forget all the time because it's not exciting and you don't really get to show your friends is that you are the most important part of your setup. Not the mouthpiece, not the ligature, not the horn itself, it's you. You make the biggest difference. And the parts of you that do that are how you produce your air, but more importantly, your natural tongue position and your oral cavity. And it took a lot of time for me personally to figure out what was going on in here. And as a result, I bought a ton of different mouthpieces in the process, hoping that they would do the work for me. So one thing that I want you to do if you're considering buying a new mouthpiece is first off, just figure out what your tongue is doing while you're playing. Do you play with a high tongue position, meaning that when you're blowing air through the horn, you're making more of an E sound? And if you do that naturally, you're gonna feel your tongue go like this. Or do you play with an oo sound, which is naturally gonna be a lower tongue position? And despite making really silly noises, what this does is it basically creates an internal baffle inside your mouth. If you play with a high tongue position and you slap on a mouthpiece that's got a lot of baffle and reduced inner dimensions, you're going to have a super bright sound if we're just, you know, putting this into a thought experiment. So for me personally, I know that I play with a high tongue position. I wanted the dark warm sound, so I chose to pair that with a mouthpiece that had a lot less baffle, a lot more chamber, more internal volume, so that I could balance out my natural tongue position. Now, if you play with a low tongue position and you wanna have a bright sound, you're gonna need more baffle, you're gonna basically need less internal volume in your mouthpiece setup. So just having that little bit of knowledge about what's going on in here is gonna make it a lot easier to hopefully get the sound you want, and don't forget, just because somebody plays a mouthpiece, you're not gonna sound exactly like that even if you buy the same one that they're using.